understanding, used 160 times in 156 verses of the Bible, the intelligence and insight of both God and men. The biblical principle is asking forgiveness is not enough. There should be consideration to restitution. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry, and you are tuned in to the weekend edition of Quick Study Television, taking you through the Bible in one year. Today, we focus on the book of Nehemiah, chapter 11 to be exact. As we look at Nehemiah, we're going to be focusing on learning restitution. Now, why is this important? It's true that Forgiveness is commanded, but restitution is the attitude of Christ. We're going to be talking about that and much more as we continue along, so stay there. And Corey is here with Bible Archaeology and History. Corey? Today we are going to be taking a look at the rise of Cyrus the Great, King of Persia, the king who allowed the Israelites to return to Judah and Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the temple and the walls. From, from history, what an interesting guy. Very interesting guy. Uh, and, and we'll show the Cyrus Cylinder in one of our recent Bible guides from the archaeology page on the front. Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries, Ryan. Well, today we wrap things up with marine biologist and genetics expert Dr. Robert Carter. And I'm going to be asking him two questions. First, if coral reefs disprove a young Earth. And second, what he thinks is the apologetic value for evidences for creation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to study on through the Bible. Get out your Bible and your Bible guides or your quick study tablets. Let's explore together. Here's Corey. Right now, I would like to take a look with you at a city and a plane that has gathered a lot of attention in the past and has also gathered attention for its supposed role in biblical prophecy. Now, biblical prophecy is uh, writings that were written in ancient times that pertain to the future, some of which uh, is still uh, unhappened yet, so it even pertains to our future. Uh, the city that we're talking about today is Megiddo. It had a critical importance in Israel and Judah's past and a lot of really key events happened there. So take a look at Megiddo with me. The ancient city of Megiddo strategically sits in the Jezreel Valley that runs right across the land of Israel, connecting the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the Jordan River in the east, a giant natural highway. It also intersects with several north-south trade routes, so whoever controls Megiddo can exert widespread power over the trade and warfare of the land. Famously, Pharaoh of Egypt, Tutmos III, said that capturing Megiddo was as good as capturing 1,000 cities. From all the levels of destruction at the city, it's clear that many other leaders felt the same way. In fact, the reason Megiddo is such a large hill today is due to the city being destroyed and rebuilt so many times. The newer levels were built right on top of the destroyed layers. From what archaeologists can reconstruct, Megiddo was under Egyptian control until some point during the biblical time period of the Judges. By the time King Solomon came to the throne, Megiddo was one of his building projects. He fortified the city's walls and installed one of his famous six-chambered gates. 
After the kingdom of Israel split under Solomon's son Rehoboam, the fate of Megiddo was to be conquered and reconquered by nations vying for control. But there is one incident that stands out, the death of King Josiah. The once dominant nation of Assyria was struggling to hold off the growing power of Babylon. Egypt was marching up through Judah to help Assyria, but Josiah decided to stand in the way. At Megiddo, Josiah was killed in battle. He was the last king in the line of David who rose to the throne without foreign invention, and he lost his life here. Biblical prophecy says that one day, the Messiah will win another battle here and usher back the days of David's throne. It's time to study the wise guys of the Bible and they're all around us as our study takes us into the great book of Nehemiah. We're looking at 9 through 11 today. We'll be focusing on Nehemiah 11 now. Listen, it is one thing to tell someone you're sorry for your sin. It is very much another thing to ask forgiveness of your sin. You see, asking forgiveness requires a response from the person you offended. It is one thing to ask forgiveness for sin and another to provide restitution for sin. Now in Nehemiah 11, there were very many wise guys who chose willingly to be a part of the 10th or the tithe restitution of restoring Jerusalem. Others were chosen by law. You see, to live and to settle your family in ancient Jerusalem, the object of God's wrath during this time, was both a safety risk and bad for your reputation. But God's wise guys did it anyway. And this study helps us to understand why Restitution is an important fact of restoration. Now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine-tenths were to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. These are the heads of the province who dwelt in Jerusalem. But in the cities of Judah, everyone dwelt in his own possession in their cities, Israelites, priests, Levites, Nethanim, and descendants of Solomon's servants. Also in Jerusalem dwelt some of the children of Judah and of the children of Benjamin. The children of Judah, Athiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Malhalel, of the children of Perez, and Messiah, the son of Baruch, the son of Kalhoza, the son of Haziah, the son of Adiah, the son of Joyarib, the son of Zechariah, the son of Shalani. All the sons of Perez who dwelt at Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. And these are the sons of Benjamin, Salu, the son of Meshulam, the son of Joed, the son of Padiah, the son of Kaliah, the son of Messiah, the son of Ithiel, the son of Jeshiah, and after him, Gabai and Salai, 928. Joel, the son of Zikri, was their overseer, and Judah, the son of Senua, was second over the city. Of the priests, Jediah, the son of Jehoiarib, and Jachin, Sariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of Marioth, the son of Ahitib was the leader of the house of God. Nehemiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Thank you for staying with us. You are watching the weekend edition of the Quick Study Television program. I'm Rod Hembry, and today we are looking at a passage of scripture that is over 2,500 years old that comes to us to teach us 
how to deal with restitution. What is restitution? We'll come on to that in a moment. Let me give you the scene. Israel and Judah have been in captivity for 70 years. Now they have come back with people like Ezra and Nehemiah. They are rebuilding the temple and Jerusalem. The problem is Jerusalem was the, was the object of God's wrath because such paganism developed there. God destroyed the city back in 588 BC by the Babylonians. Now there has to be restoration and restitution. Now with that in mind, we read Nehemiah chapter 11. Not a popular time to live in Jerusalem. Not a good time to move to Jerusalem. But nevertheless, this was a time of great restitution. Let's learn from it. Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 1. Now the leaders of the people dealt at Jerusalem, or dwelt at Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lot to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, a kind of human tithe, if you would, the holy city. The nine-tenths were to dwell in other cities, and the people blessed all of the men who willingly, now there were those who willingly offered themselves to be a part of the restitution of Jerusalem. Very interesting. These are the heads of the province who dwelt at Jerusalem, but in the cities of Judah, everyone dwelt in his own positions with his own possessions in their cities. The Israelites, the priests, the Levites, the Nathanium, that is the guards of the temple, the descendants of Solomon's servants. Also in Jerusalem dwelt some of the children of Judah and the children of Benjamin. Now the children of Judah were Ethaiah, the son of Azza, or Uzziah, and the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephthahiah, and the son of Mal, Hal, Al, Al and also the son of Perez. Now these are very complicated names, and I'm probably not pronouncing all of them right, but I wanted to pronounce each of them because these men made a sacrifice. I want to mention their name and broadcast their names. They made a sacrifice, and they should be noted in, in the records of all history, uh, modern and past. It brings us to this point about restitution. Right restitution is part of returning God's favor where once God's judgment was. Now restitution is helping to pay back the damages that you caused. So when my, if my son were caught shoplifting and he shoplifted a candy bar, I would make my son pay for that candy bar. That's restitution. Not merely ask forgiveness, but also return or repair the damage that was done if possible. That's restitution. And that's a very important part of restoration because restitution also restores the relationship and begins to build a foundation of trust again. Verse 5, And Masai, the son of Barak, the son of Kol Haza, the son of Hazai, the son of Adaiah, the son of Jehorib, the son of Zechariah, the son of Shiloniah, or Shiloni, the sons of Perez, who dwelt at Jerusalem, were 468, look at this now, valiant men. This is important. These weren't just, you know, people who, who weren't any, they, these were important people to be a part of this restitution. So right restitution makes us remember to avoid disobedience to God's word and often comes in the form of consequences for our sin. You see, beloved, the consequences of our sin give us the wonderful opportunity to find ways to willingly make restitution. Very, very important. Forgiveness is key. Asking forgiveness is key, but restitution is a part of revival in the relationship. When you try to fix what you damaged, you are creating conditions for a revival in the relationship. This is very important. And so now we go on to ne uh, Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 10. Of the priest, Jedidiah, the son of jo Jorah, and Jachin, Saraiah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshalem, the son of Zadok, the son of Meraioth, the son of Ahitub, these were the leaders of the house of God. So here we have the leaders of the house of God in Jerusalem. Very important. They should be because that's where the temple is being rebuilt. It brings me to this last study wise point. Right restitution is important not to achieve our salvation, but to remove Satan's strongholds. The corrupt priesthood brought demonic strongholds to the temple. The reason that these high-level priests were put here in this time 
was not only because the temple was here, but this was the scene of the crime. This was the place where Satan had violated them and they had let him. Now these men were called to remove the curse of Satan and restore right relationship with God. Beloved, I challenge you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't simply see when you make mistakes with people as I'll just ask forgiveness and move on. Seek to restore the relationship if possible. Sometimes in some cases it's not possible. It's been so much damage. But where possible, seek to restore, bring restitution to the relationship and God will help you through the Holy Spirit to discover how. These come from the words of Jeremiah. Consider them today. There's a lot of history recorded in the Bible about Cyrus, king of Persia. He was prophesied before he was even born, before he even came to reign. And then there's a lot of history that happened because of King Cyrus of Persia, his a proclamation to let the Israelites go back to Jerusalem and build the temple and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, King Cyrus actually had a policy of religious freedom across his empire, which was a relatively new and revolutionary idea for the time time period. Right now, what you and I are going to do is track the rise of Cyrus, king of Persia, from the records of Persia itself. Historical tradition tells us that Median king Astyages had an ominous dream about his daughter. He dreams that she would have a child that will take over his kingdom. This is not necessarily a bad thing, so Asyages chooses for her an already subservient king to be her husband, the king of Persia. Apparently, when his daughter conceives right away, Asyages becomes nervous and schemes to murder the child. But the plot fails. His daughter finds out, and we are told that she never forgives him. Her son, she names Cyrus. Cyrus has both Median and Persian royal blood. History reveals weaknesses and mistakes made by Cyrus's aging grandfather. So much so that there were secret hopes placed on Cyrus, who was a Persian prince, by even officials and leaders in the Median palace. Soon enough, Cyrus does fulfill Astyages' dream. He takes over Media Persia and holds the allegiances of both people groups. Quick Study TV presents the Quick Study Wise Guide, published every month. Twelve Bible commentaries on the passages we cover through the television program and going through the Bible in one year. This all original material is packaged in a beautiful booklet containing 32 pages of exclusive Bible commentary from Rod Hembry. The Quick Study Wise Guide is not available in bookstores or online anywhere except through the BibleDiscoveryTV.com website. Don't miss a day of your journey through the Bible. When you support regularly with a gift of any amount, we will automatically send you the Quick Study Wise Guide every single month. To write and give, send to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can call at 519-940-8338 or 724-733-8336. You can also give safely online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. You're watching the Quick Study television program. It is time for Rye the Science Guy, right? Well, we've spent three months talking with Dr. Carter, and it's been great. 
And coming up now in this final interview, I ask him two questions. First, if coral reefs disprove a young Earth, and second, what he thinks is the apologetic value for evidences for creation. Here's Dr. Carter. One of the big arguments uh, in favor of evolutionary theory, supposedly, is that uh, coral reefs disprove a young Earth because it would take much too long for coral reefs to grow. They're too, they're too big, they're too deep, uh, that corals grow too slowly. Um, but actually, I, um, I don't agree. Uh, when we look at coral reefs around the world, most coral reefs are only a few thousand years old. And the reason for that is even in the evolutionary model, they have an ice age that ended about 10,000 years ago. Well, during the ice age, all the areas in the world today where coral reefs grow, the sea level is about 300 feet lower. So any place where coral reefs growing today was dry ground except for maybe a new, a new volcano that might have come up and made a new area for coral reefs. So the entire Great Barrier Reef of Australia was dry ground in their model 10,000 years ago. Creationists this way, well, the Ice Age was, was after, after the flood, so the Ice Age probably ended about 4,000 years ago. The difference between 4,000 years and 10,000 years is essentially nothing when you're talking about so many assumptions about timing and rates and I don't have a problem saying that that even the largest structures in the world underwater the coral reef structures are geologically young because well, the evolution is saying the same thing. When people are um, are asking questions about Christianity or a person seriously inquiring and they want to know and in the process of actually becoming a Christian there's actually two different paths to take. One is a path of faith, the other is a path of evidence. Um, if there's absolutely no evidence for something, faith is a tricky proposition because people know that if something is true there should be evidence for it. I used to believe that um, that that faith can get you to heaven and evidence can get you to heaven. Each one was okay. But that's not true. And then I used to say that, oh, well, faith will get you almost there and then you can use evidence to fill up the rest of the gap. Well, that's not true either. Actually, faith gets you to heaven, but facts, evidence, are like golden paving bricks on that bridge. It makes a wonderful, beautiful bridge. It makes it pleasant to walk on um, because it's just so beautiful. There is so much evidence for creation. I know in, in, in my, own, my own life, I was struggling with Christianity because I was becoming an evolutionist. I had actually become an evolutionist and Christianity was falling apart. And every time I tried to merge somehow millions of years of evolution with the Bible, my, my Bible lost. And when the evolutionary story started fa falling apart, it was because I started learning facts about the world, facts about science, facts about history. that didn't mesh with the evolutionary story. And so that finally crumbled and really it was, it was God tugging in my heart. It was my spirit saying that I know a God exists, now I need some answers. And when those answers came in, it was a wonderful confirmation. I'd like to personally thank Dr. Carter for taking the time to talk with us and discuss these many different issues. If you'd like to see more of what he does, then head over to creation.com, where there are literally thousands of scientific articles. This is a really great ministry, Creation Ministries International. Creation.com, check him out. I have a question for you, both of you. We'll start with Corey. Corey, did you know that Quick Study Television is available online on an iPhone? An Android, an or droid, a the droid, whatever conjunction you want to come up with, droid. Did you know that, Corey? Well, I did not know about all those droids that I think maybe you made up, but I did know that Quick Study is available on multi for multiple formats on multiple mobile devices. In fact, it's available uh, anywhere there's a cell phone that receives any kind of video, and we have all kinds of different video available. Did you know, Ryan, did you know that 24-7 there's a video signal coming out of BibleDiscoveryTV.com? Yes, I did. I watch it all the time. And did you know that it's on the, the, you, know, the, the you know what the Roku box is, Kari? You know what that is, the Roku box? Um, I've heard of it. It's some sort of digital box that takes the internet and puts it on your TV, I think. Very good. It's, this is like not a Bible IQ question. This is a modern technology question. <laughs> yeah, we're on the Roku box, ladies and gentlemen. Look in the channel store. Go down to, to uh, Spirituality. We're there. It's called the Bible Discovery TV Network. You'll see our logo there. And also, did you know, viewers, that I write this specifically 
for those who support this ministry. It is a Bible guide published every single month, 12,000 more than 32 pages. Bible commentary that you cannot get anywhere else except through this ministry. We reserve it for those who give an offering in any amount. So we want to encourage you to pray about becoming a partner with this ministry. Here is our address, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150, 724-733-8336. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, studio number 519-940-8338. Want to hear from other parts of the world? Use the Canadian address. Uh, we are getting your messages on all over the internet, but write to us as well. The principle of restitution has long been lost in our loose, feel-good values society. Forgiveness is part of a command of Christ, but the principle of restitution for sin is part of the attitude of Christ. When Jesus told Peter not to be an offense to the temple tax, our Lord was providing restitution to the priesthood. It was not that Jesus required it for salvation, but that he desired it for evangelization. With that we pray, Lord, help me to look out for the needs of those I have sinned against, that they may see your good works in me and glorify you. It is time to go in our Wise Up segment today through the book of Proverbs, and we are focusing on this day, Proverbs 15, 26 to 27. Here's one line from there. This is really interesting. He who is greedy for gain actually troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. Now, what does that mean? It means that if all you think, if, if all you are doing is simply for money and all you can see is getting more of it, this is actually going to bring trouble into your household. You may think that you want money to bring security in your life, but you'd be surprised how much security you can have when you come to Christ and realize that the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. Now that doesn't mean he's gonna supply you with seven houses in the Bahamas and 32 cars. It means he's gonna supply your need according to his riches and glory. Supply your need, very important. Because he gives to those who have his desires in their heart his desires in their heart, he gives to those, to the, those desires that are in their heart. I encourage you today to come to Jesus Christ. Don't let money rule you or the lack of it be cruel to you. Come to Christ in Jesus' name, realign your life and he will change your life. Pray to him today.